Welcome to LifePoint Church Online. We're so thankful that you're joining us and we are excited to worship with you today. If this is your first time joining us, we would like to know so we can connect with you. If you're watching us on Facebook, please click on the first time viewer link located in today's post. If you're watching through our website, the link will be located on the right hand side of your screen. Thanks again for being here. Now let's get to the service.
please call upon the Lord.
Good morning, LifePoint. I'm Dave. And I'm Kayla. And we want to thank you for joining us today on our Sunday service. And if this is your first time joining us, we just want to welcome you to Church Online. And it is our prayer that you will be ministered to today through the love of Jesus. If you haven't already, now would be a great time to go ahead and hit the share button. We would love for your family and friends to join us today for Church Online and see everything that God is doing here at LifePoint. Well, we're getting ready to go into our tithes and offerings. We make it super simple here at LifePoint Church to give electronically. You can text to give by texting the number 84321. Go to lpcmentor.com and click that Give tab or simply send it in the mail. You can find all of that information and our mailing address on our website. We want to thank you, LifePoint, for your generosity. Week after week, you've been so faithful in the giving of your tithes and offerings. And it is because of you that we are able to make a difference and show the love of Christ to our neighbors. So, so once, once again, again, thank you, LifePoint. So here's what you need to know this week. Our outreach team has been busy. Not only have we been able to help the McKinley Center by collecting non-perishable food items, but we're also partnering with the local homeless shelter, Project Hope, as another way that you can give in this time of need. They've made this super simple for us by providing a list of the items they are in need of. We've provided the link on our webpage. You just click the link, do a little shopping on Amazon, pay for the items, and then they're sent directly to Project Hope. If you'd like more information on this, just head over to lpcmentor.com slash Project Hope. Something amazing is happening. Join us for this daily prayer initiative, Unite 714. Thousands of churches are joining in one united prayer during church services. Millions of people are joining in on the same prayer each day at 714 in the morning and the night. We are praying and believing to see this COVID-19 halt. If you would like more prayer information, you can find that on our website at lpcbenners.com slash unite714. And last but not least, be sure to check out LifePoint Kids online, Sundays at 9 a.m. and Mondays at 7 p.m. That's it for this week. Now let's join Pastor Ken for What's Next. Hey, today we're going to start a new series entitled, What's Next? What are, what's in front of us? What should we expect? What should we be looking for? Some of you may remember that there was a book that was published in 1988, and it made a lot of news. The book said basically that Jesus Christ would come back in the rapture of the church sometime between September 11th and September 13th in 1988. Uh, then the book listed 88 reasons why Jesus would return in 1988. Well, after that date came and went, the author then published a second book called The Final Shout. And he talked about how the rapture would take place in 1988. 89. And then that date came and went. He sent another book out called The Final Shout in 1990. And then that went all the way up until 1994, another final shout. And then uh, we don't know what happened. He just kind of left the scene and nothing took place. So from 1988 to 1994, there was this book out entitled The Rapture is Going to Take Place during this time. Well, um, I think what happened then is in that time period, and it's been all throughout history, a lot of people have predicted the event of the rapture. And because dates that they've set, times that they've set have come and gone, it's kind of created a, uh, a negative, so it's kind of produced some negative press uh, when it comes to the rapture. And a lot of people start rolling their eyes when you start talking about this, or they dismiss the idea of the rapture altogether. Well, I believe that's unfortunate because the rapture is a real event. Uh, it's an event for the church. It's an event that's given in great detail. As a matter of fact, in John chapter 14, Jesus talks about the rapture. 1 Thessalonians chapter 14 Paul talks about the rapture. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul again alludes to the rapture. These scriptures are usually generally shared or used at funeral services. 
in order to encourage um, and give hope to those that are mourning. But I know that it's more than just a funeral message. It is a message of hope to all who believe. As a matter of fact, the apostle Paul wrote to T Titus, he said, we look for the blessed hope at the glorious appearing of God our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so the rapture is an event, and for the believer, it is our blessed hope. There are two people that the Bible records that were allowed to see heaven. One was the Apostle Paul. Uh, Paul doesn't give us any details, though. He kind of sets us up, and then he lets us down. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul was caught up into what he said was the third heaven, and uh, he said, what I saw, it would be unlawful for me to share with you what I experienced or what I saw. The other person who was able to get a picture or a revelation of heaven was the apostle John. John sees it, and then he's commanded to write about it. And so John writes about that vision in Revelation chapter 4 and in Revelation chapter 5, and we'll talk about that here in a minute. But before John writes about the coming uh, of the Lord, before John talks about what he saw in heaven, John also shares with us the coming tribulation. As a matter of fact, the bulk of the book of Revelation takes up the event of what happens after the rapture of the church. And so John has given basically three events that he's to write about. The first event is he's commanded to write. The second thing that happens to John is he is called up to heaven. And the third thing that happens to John is he's captivated by the glory of God, and he shares that with us in the book of Revelation. So first of all, John is told to look down because he has to write. Then he's told to look up because he's caught up into heaven. And when he gets to heaven, he's told to look around because he's to, to describe to us the glories of heaven. And so John starts to talk to us and John starts to describe those things in Revelation chapter 17, or chapter 1, I'm sorry, verse 17 through 20. This is what he says. He said, when I saw him, speaking of Jesus, he said, I fell at his feet as dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, who is alive forevermore. Jesus is the only person who could say that. He said, I have the keys of Hades and death. Now watch what he said. He says, write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. Write the things which you have seen, things which are, and the things which will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. One of the things, um, one of the things that you notice about the book of Revelation is that the book of Revelation is written in symbols, types, and shadows. It's full of signs, and it's full of symbols. And it starts at the very beginning. If you go to Revelation 1 and 1, it says this, He said, He sent and signified it. He sent and signified it. In other words, what that means is he gave it its signs. That's what signifies means, signified means. He gave it his signs, um, symbols, pictures. 
And some of those pictures we read, read about already, lampstands, and we read about trumpets, and we read about bowls, and we read about beasts, and we read about water. And the question is why? Why is the book of Revelation filled with all of these signs? Why is it filled with all of these symbols? Well, I believe there are three reasons. Number one, I believe the first one is preservation. You see, symbols can withstand the test of time. They transcend human language, language and culture. They're not weakened as time goes on. The second reason that I believe that, that God used signs and symbols to describe what was going on during this period was emotion. You know, when you read symbols, you are aroused. They kind of, uh, uh, they, they arouse the senses. There's usually a strong emotion that's attached to it. For instance, if I would just say to you that a dictator is going to come onto the world scene, well, that doesn't do as much as someone saying that, you know, and I saw a beast rising out of the sea, describing the Antichrist who was going to rise to power. So, you know, it does something to the reader. It, it, it strikes the reader. It lets an emotion come from the reader. And the third thing is orientation. There are 404 verses in the book of Revelation. Nearly 300 of them reference back to the Old Testament and their symbols. That's why, even though it might sound and seem weird to you and I, to the first century Jewish reader, um, they were familiar with this type of literature. You can find that with Daniel. You can find it with Ezekiel. You can find it with Zechariah. So for the first century Jewish reader, it made more sense to them. And so John gives us an outline, or he's given an outline on how to write the book of Revelation, and it's found in verse 19. Did you notice what it said? He's commanded to write the things which you have seen. He said, write the things which are, and write the things which will take place after this. This is important because this is exactly what John does throughout the whole book. This is how the book is laid out from chapter 19 or from chapter 1, verse 19. It becomes the outline for the entire book. Listen to what he says. He said, I want you to write the things which you have seen. Well, what did John see? John saw in chapter 1, John was given a vision of Jesus, and he writes that vision down. He writes it down in detail of what he had seen. And he had never seen Jesus like this before. He remembered Jesus while he was here on earth. But now John sees Jesus in his exalted state. And when he turned and saw him, he said, I saw one like the Son of Man, but he was vastly different. And John writes that. As a matter of fact, I shared that with you on Wednesday, how that when he saw Jesus, he saw him. His hair was white as wool. His eyes were as a blaze of fire. His feet, his feet were like brass. He saw the resurrected Jesus in the book of Revelation. And then John is told to write the things which are. And John does that. John writes the things which are in chapter 2 and chapter 3 of the book of Revelation. Those were the things that were going on at this time. They were going on at the churches, the churches in Asia Minor. Uh, in fact, if you look in verse number 20, the meaning of a couple of the symbols that we talked about are given to us. So we don't even have to guess what Jesus or what John is saying. We don't even have to guess the mystery of the seven stars, which were in my right hand, the seven golden lampstands. Well, the seven stars, he tells us, are the seven angels of the churches of Asia Minor. Now, these angels could mean heavenly messengers, but they could also mean 
earthly messengers. In other words, it could be giving reference to the pastors of those seven churches or the angels who had been assigned over those seven churches. The seven lampstands, which we saw and read about, the Bible tells us these are the seven churches. And they say, the Bible said that, it, that they are in his hand, meaning they are in his authority. They are under his protection. Now, these seven churches, which are written about in chapters 2 and also in chapter 3, were actual, literal congregations in Asia Minor. They were about 100 miles in radius. They were close to each other, which would be today modern Turkey. And so, they were literal, actual, living congregations at the time of John. The churches are represented by a lampstand. The lampstand raises the oil lamp, and so it raises the lamp high so that it gives off light. And this tells us something about the church. It tells us that the church is to rise up and to stand out in dark times. There must be oil in the lamp in order for the lamp to burn. And we know that that oil is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. Because without the oil, the lamp is not going to burn. Without the Holy Spirit burning in our church churches, we're not going to be able to combat the darkness in this world. And so, didn't Jesus say this about the church anyway? Didn't he tell us that we were and we are the light of the world? And so, people that are in the world, that are sitting in darkness, are looking for a way out of their darkness. But if they look at God's people, and if they look at the church, and they see that we are in darkness as well, well, that doesn't offer a whole lot of help to them. And so, hopefully, during this time of quarantine, during this time of isolation, during this time of preparation, because that's what I believe is happening right now, I believe it is a time of preparation that we have spent this time so that our lamps can be refilled with the oil, so that our churches can be refilled with the Spirit of God. I believe that God is refilling His church all across the globe right now, all around the world. God is refilling the church with fresh oil, and I believe the church is going to shine bright in these, in these hours that we are faced with right now. Isaiah commanded it this way in Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 1. He said, it's during times like these that the church needs to arise and shine so, so that the glory of the Lord can be seen upon us. I believe in this prophetic timetable that we're in that the church is going to emerge out of this with our oil in our lamps, and we're going to emerge with the power of the Holy Spirit. We're going to emerge with the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and the glory of God is going to be seen upon the church, and we're going to penetrate the darkness, and we are going to make a difference in these last days. Come on, if you believe that, just type in right now, just in bold print, and just uh, just type in right now, yes, that's going to happen. Come on, if you believe that, help me out here and help me preach with a yes. I believe that's what's going to happen. One of the things that's going to happen in these final days that we are living in. Now, the seven churches that John wrote about, as I mentioned earlier, these are the churches that were in Asia Minor. Now, if you notice verse 19 of chapter 1, he said, write the things which you have seen, the revelation of Jesus. Then he says, write the things which are, that's what was going on to the seven churches at that time. And then he says, I want you to write the things that will take place after this. This moves us into Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1. And look at what it says. After this. It says after this, after chapter 1, after chapter 2, after chapter 3. In other words, after the revelation and after addressing the church, this is what's happens. After this, I looked 
and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. Well, you know, let me just interject something here because Paul or John has been caught up into heaven. And a lot of times we talk about how that when we get to heaven that, um, you know, Peter's going to be standing there at the gate. He's going to have his little clipboard. He's going to make sure that we can all, that we've done what we need to do to get into heaven. Well, that's not what the Bible tells us. The Bible doesn't mention a gate. The, di- the Bible mentions a door. He says, there was a door opened in heaven. Well, we know who that door is. That door is Jesus. Jesus said, I am the door. He's the only way that we're getting in. And he says, I am the door. So John sees that door. He sees Jesus standing there. And the voice I heard, the first heard speaking, or first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here. Underline that. Remember that phrase, come up here. And then he says, I will show you what must take place after this. What must take place after these things? Well, after what things? After the vision that he saw in chapter 1, and after the vision or after the revelation of the seven churches in chapters 2 and 3. He said, after these things, John was suddenly in heaven. Suddenly, John is in the presence of God, and John sees it. He sees the throne, he sees the glory, and John begins to write about it. And he reveals that to us in chapters 4 and in chapters 5. Now, I need you to follow me right here and just look at this. The church has been the focus in chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3. In the book of Revelation, chapter 1, 2, and 3, the church is mentioned 19 times. 19 times the word church appears. And then the church is, or I should say, the church was the focus. It's Jesus in the church, the church and Jesus. And then something happened. Now, suddenly in chapter four, after this, John, is, John says, I must show you what must take place. And it's like the church has disappeared. It's not seen. It's not spoken about. It's not even mentioned until we get to the end of the book of Revelation, when Jesus comes back and the kingdom is developed here on the earth, the new heaven and the new earth is put in place, that's when the word church appears. But from chapter 4 on, it's gone. You don't hear mention of it anymore. So, John is instantly in heaven, and I believe that this is what we would call a preview of coming attractions. This is a depiction of the rapture of the church because Revelation 4 and 1 sounds a little like 1 Thessalonians 4 and 16. If you're not familiar with this passage of Scripture, let's take a look at it right here. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17 says this. Notice the wording. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. There's the trumpet sound. And the dead in Christ will rise first, and after that, we who are alive, or still alive, that are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so will we ever be forevermore with them and the Lord. This is what is known as the rapture of the church. Now, I hear people all the time saying that the word rapture is not mentioned in the Bible. It isn't in the Bible. And that's true. The word rapture is not mentioned in the Bible. But I don't know if you realize this or not, but the word Bible isn't mentioned in the Bible either. 
But here's what we know about the rapture. The teaching, the idea of the rapture, the doctrine of the rapture is clearly there. And it's right there in 1 Thessalonians 4, and I shared it with you. We just read it. We who are alive and remain shall be, here it is, caught up. Caught up. Um, it's the Greek word harpazo. It's shown 18 different times in 13 different verses in the New Testament. And when it is translated, it's translated four times this way, to catch up or to be caught up. Three times it means to take something by force. One time it's translated to snatch away, twice to snatch, twice to catch away, twice to pluck, or one to pull. And this is where we get the word rapture from. Now I want you to listen to verse 17 with me from the Weist translation of the New Testament, written by a Greek scholar who teacher who is a teacher at Moody Bible Institute, Kenneth Weist. Listen to the translation. Listen to what he says. He says, we shall be snatched away forcibly in masses of saints having the appearance of clouds for a welcome meeting with the Lord in the lower atmosphere. Hmm. It doesn't get any more graphic than that. It doesn't get any plainer than that. You see, what Paul wrote about, John experienced. He said, it's like a voice, like a trumpet that says, come up here, which illustrates that that's what's going to happen to God's people when the church age is done. The Lord will descend from heaven with a shout. Some have asked, what is he going to shout? Well, the Bible doesn't tell us what he's going to say. I can only speculate, but let me just say this. Maybe everyone is going to hear in their own language, come up here. So in Revelation chapter 4 and chapter 5, I believe the church is in heaven. The church is safely in heaven, tucked away for a seven-year honeymoon. A seven-year, as a seven-year tribulation is taking place on the earth. After that seven years, Jesus is going to return. He's going to stop um, the war, and he's going to come back with us. He's going to stop the judgment on the earth, and we're coming back with him, I should say, and we're going to reign for him, with him, for a thousand years. Now, this is what I found interesting. It's similar to a Jewish, Jewish wedding, because at a Jewish wedding in ancient times, there would be a wedding ceremony, and then the bride and the groom are, was followed by a feast that usually lasted seven days, and while the people were feasting and just hanging out, the bride and the groom would be tucked away. They would be away from the crowd, and they would be away from the world. And at the end of that time, the groom would then come back, and he would present his bride after that wedding. So, I believe that's what takes place in heaven. And meanwhile, back on earth, chapter 6 through chapter 19 is the worst possible tribulation period the earth has ever seen in its history, according to Jesus. Worse than any other time in the history of the world. This is where the wrath of God is poured out. Some are asking, are we getting ready to enter chapter 4? Are we getting ready to enter the chapter 4 of the book of Revelation? Are we looking at the catching away of the church? 
Well, I don't have that answer. I shared with you a couple of weeks ago on our Wednesday teaching um, about what I thought was going on, how I didn't believe that this was Revelation 13. It looks more like Leviticus chapter 13, and we need to respond like 1 Corinthians chapter 13 until Romans chapter 13 is fulfilled. And so now all that teaching is back on our YouTube channel. You can go back there or you can go on lpcmentor.com. You can catch that teaching as well. Because the Bible plainly tells us no man knows the day nor the hour. So I can't stand here today and tell you that the rapture is taking place tomorrow, next week. I don't know. You remember the beginning of my message? 88 reasons why the rapture will take place in 1988. Well, you know, two people, two among many people, but two of the people who read that book were Jamie and myself. We read 88 reasons why Jesus will return in 1988. And it was during that time that we gave our hearts to the Lord. And so God even used that as a means to draw us to him. And it's what, 30 some years later, and here we are. But I just want you to know, I want you to know that I've never lived one day regretting that decision I made back in September of 1988. And I don't know, I don't know when the Lord's going to return, but I do know that you and I can be ready for his return. That we can hear that, come up here, and that we can be ready to be raptured out of this place and be reunited with our loved ones and spend that seven-year time period in the presence of the Lord before we come back to this earth to rule and reign with Jesus Christ, our Lord. I'm going to pray for you right now. And maybe your heart has drifted away from the Lord and maybe you're not serving him right now. I want to give you an opportunity to do so. Would you just bow your head right where you are and would you pray this prayer with me? Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you just as I am. I acknowledge I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. I ask you now to forgive me of my sins and to wash me in your blood. I believe that you are the Lord. I believe you died for me. I believe you rose for me. And I believe you're coming very soon. And this very moment, I give my heart and I give my life to you. Thank you, Jesus, for giving me this opportunity. It's in your holy name that I pray. Amen and amen. Hey, listen, if you prayed that prayer, God bless you and thank you. It's the greatest thing you'll ever do in your life. We'd like to help you and give you more information. If you'll just go over to lpcmentor.com, uh, our website, and let us know you prayed that prayer. We want to put some more information in your hands, and we want to be able to pray with you as well. I want to thank you again for tuning in, and I look forward to seeing you on Wednesday evening, 630, our Bible study, and right back here next Sunday. Sunday at 10 a.m., 7 p.m., and our children meet at 9 a.m. God bless you, and have a blessed week. Thanks again for being here today. What a wonderful time of worship and a great word from Pastor Ken. We pray that they were a blessing to your life. We are honored to be a part of your life, and we know that God's hand is resting upon you and your family. Please know that we love you and we're praying for you. Have a great week, and we'll see you again here at The Point.